Scott Neal. This year we have planned a series of town talks around different operations of the city. Tonight's town talk will be about the Eden, will be about the Edina Police Department. Later this year, we will have a similar town talk about the operations of the fire department. Police Chief Todd Milburn will speak for about 30 minutes. After his presentation, we will take questions. Those of you who would like to ask a question can call 786-496-5601 with conference pin 1798074 pound sign. Plus, press uh, star one on your telephone keypad when you are ready to ask a question during, the, during that part of the event. An operator will mute your line and place you into the queue until it is your turn to speak. We will end tonight's town talk when there are no more questions or at 8 p.m., whichever is first. However, you can continue to ask questions and make comments online at thebettertogetheredina.org for the next week. The online conversation closes Tuesday, July 25th. Now I would like to formally introduce Chief Milburn, who came to the city of Edina in 2021 after nearly a 30-year career in law enforcement in the city of Brooklyn Park, where he started in 1992. There, he worked his way up from the position of community service officer to deputy police chief. Todd holds a bachelor's degree in organizational management and leadership from Concordia University in St. Paul. Please join me in welcoming Chief Todd Milburn to tell us more about the operations of the Edina Police Department. Chief. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you everyone and uh, appreciate you having me here tonight to talk a little bit about crime. This is a good opportunity for us to just kind of overview some of the things that we've been seeing here in the city of Edina over the last year. So tonight what we're gonna do is walk you through some PowerPoint slides here and of course open it up for questions afterwards. Uh, just to start off a little bit more on the introduction side of things for me, uh, again, I came from uh, Brooklyn Park where I worked there for just under 30 years. I started um, right out of high school and I worked in a variety of different positions to include CSO, patrol officer, investigator. I became a supervisor and I supervised officers on the street and worked my way up to different positions such as PIO, which is a public information officer position and then all the way up into the command staff ranks before I came here. I'm a native of St. Paul. I grew up in St. Paul. Um, before I traveled over to Brooklyn Park, that's where I resided and went to high school. So I've been uh, within or residing in the metro area for my entire life. Um, coming here to Edina has been a great experience. It's been almost two years. It's been uh, just an outstanding opportunity for me to really work in this community, uh, lead a, a fantastic organization, and very dedicated men and women that serve this community. It's just been a pleasure for me to interact with our staff here and very proud to be here. So tonight's talk, uh, some of the things and just highlights that we're gonna get into here tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about our organization of our department, a little bit uh, around our structure, who we are and what we do. We're gonna talk a little bit about our current crime trends, some of the things that we're seeing here in our community. We're gonna offer some crime prevention tips. We're gonna kind of reaffirm some of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of years. Uh, we're really big in our community engagement events and some of our new initiatives uh, that fold into that work. We're gonna discuss that and cover that, and as well as cover a uh, number of our new initiatives that we're really excited about moving forward. And lastly, um, we'll talk a little bit more about our officer wellness initiatives and the things that we're doing to support our, our officers here in our department. A little bit of a breakdown of our, our organization, uh, the, how we um, unfold and the things that we do on a day-to-day -day business uh, model. Uh, we have three different divisions here. We have investigations, patrol, and administration. On the sworn side, we currently have 55 officers here serving our community. Our, our normal staffing is 58. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of vacancies that we currently have, but if you look at this and break it down a little bit further, some of the other services that we provide are canine units. We have two of those. We have a SWAT team here as part of a consortium where we work closely with other SWAT teams uh, in the region here. Uh, within the SWAT team, we have a negotiators team. Uh, we also have a drone unit, um, and we have the list is, is um, long and extensive. Uh, this, this department provides many of the same opportunities as does any large scale department here in the local area. And so uh, it's one of the reasons why we have such great staff that want to come here and work because of the opportunities that we provide. On the support side of things, we have 25 support members. I want to highlight our 911 dispatch center. Currently, uh, we have 10 um, positions in that, and, and we also provide 911 service to our community through uh, police and also fire dispatch, and also through our paramedic team as well, provide that great outstanding service with excellent response times here to our community. We have six cadets on staff. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. One crime analyst, the crime analyst provides analysts uh, for our staff and also for the community on the trends and patterns that we're seeing on the crime front. And we have one administrative assistant within our police department as well. 
Just a quick snapshot of call data. This just gives you a little bit of a viewpoint going back the last five years for each year, the number of calls and a number of, I would say, events that we get ourselves into. That could be 911 response or proactive work. Uh, in 2019, we were just over 60,000. And if you look at the chart, uh, things start to kind of ratchet down. And a lot of that's tied back to COVID and traffic stops. And so we pulled back on traffic stops as a result of COVID and reconfiguring some of our priorities. But as you uh, as you look back the last three years, we've been pretty consistent and steady on the number of calls for service, which we average about 47 to 50,000 per year. And it looks like this year's trending at about the same uh, um, number of calls as well. The majority of the crime calls are for property related crimes. We're gonna, again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit about some of our auto theft issues and burglaries that we're seeing. Just by comparison, just to give you a little quick snapshot of some of our crime data, uh, some of the current crime data this year as compared to last year, so we call that year to date, breaks down in the following fashion. Our theft from autos uh, are down 28%, which is awesome. Uh, burglaries are also down 28%. Cadillac converter thefts, that's been a big talking point over the metro, uh, throughout the metro area for the last couple of years, and I'm happy to report that that's down 55%. Robberies are up just a little bit by four. I'm gonna share a couple examples of what's driving that number up. And our auto thefts are up 27%. Auto thefts, you're gonna hear me talk a lot about that because that continues to be a problem for us in this community and also across the metro area. Most of the auto thefts committed in Indiana are done it with uh, keys in the ignition. We are often seeing keys that are inside an open garage door and people that are looking to do that kind of crime are just traveling through neighborhoods and looking for those easy opportunities, going inside of a vehicle with a fob inside and just starting or pressing the start button and once it's up and running, then they're off um, and they're driving around the metro area. The map on the right hand side depicts the different uh, auto thefts that we've seen in Edina and as you'll note, it's primarily along the east side of, uh, of our city here. Relatively new is something called NIMBRS reporting, and this is uh, a mandate that came out from the federal authorities a couple years ago, and it requires all police departments across the nation to report out their crime through a new format, and this works itself into the BCA, which is our local authority to report out. What you see here are three different examples of our current crime trends looking back over the last three years or three different categories looking back the last three years. And this is something that is published on the BCA website. So if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, you can go to the BCA website and just draw this up and you can sort out the data as you see fit. But we thought this would be a good opportunity just to showcase a little bit of the trends that we're seeing here in the city of Edina. The first one is the crimes against property. And if you look at the bar graph here and you notice that there's a significant drop in 2023, um, shaded in green, that depicts um, a pretty nice drop for us. So I want you to focus on May and not June. The June crime data is not quite in yet, and we were not able to take uh, that month out. But if you look at May, you'll notice that there's a pretty nice drop in this category as well. Same thing for crimes against person in the upper right-hand corner, and also at the bottom, crimes against society. We're starting to see some drops and some trends, which is a good thing for us here. Crimes against society, think about it in terms of narcotics complaints or low-level offenses as a further description of what that category means. Uh, we've been working really hard on a new crime map we recently took on and transferred over into a new CAD RMS system. And as part of that work, we're, we're pleased to report out that we're going to have a new crime mapping uh, software available or a tool available to our community here uh, later on this summer. And what that's going to do is allow anybody that wants to go online and take a look at different crimes that may have occurred in any particular neighborhood, uh, close to you or not. And we will share a link on our website. And if you're interested in that, you can just look it up. And if you look at the map on the right hand side, of the screen, you'll notice that there are different numbers and different icons. By example, if you were just to select on any kind of an icon that had a number on it, say for example one, and you click on that button, it'll open up the number of calls. In this case, if it's number one, they'll just uh, would have happened to have one event would happen to have occurred there. Uh, same thing if you had 10, you'd have 10 events, uh, events in that area. And once you open up uh, that icon, it'll show you, it'll list out the different crime types that would have occurred in that area. And that's gonna be anything from a traffic stop to an arrest to a, uh, any kind of a 911 uh, complaint, animal complaint, all the way on up to a robbery. So it's gonna give you some detail about what happened in a particular area. And we think that's a very good thing for our residents to stay informed and, be trans and that we can be transparent about what may have occurred in a particular neighborhood. So we're excited about that release. And like I said earlier, that's gonna occur later this summer. And we will be sure to advertise and get the word out as to exactly when that's gonna be released to the public here. 
We've had a lot of conversations lately about significant crimes across the metro area. Uh, Edina has not been immune to that, and so I just wanted to highlight some notable cases um, and, and kind of just give some follow-up about some of the progress reports that we've had on these. Uh, back in July 5th of 2023, we had, of this year, we had a burglary in progress. It fits that same MO that I just talked about where we had an existing stolen car drive into a community. Uh, the occupants of that car were looking for an opportunity. They found a house that had a garage door open. Occupants of that stolen car exited, walked into that garage and they pressed um, the start button hoping that there was a fob inside. Uh, there was a fob inside but fortunately for us we had a very alert neighbor who called 911 as this was unfolding. We were able to get officers into the area immediately and as a result of that uh, we were able to find that recently stolen car. Those occupants or those suspects fled into the neighborhood and we had a per um, eventually a perimeter and we were successful in identifying, locating and arresting all five of those suspects. Uh, those, uh, that case has been presented to the county attorney for charging and the charges have been brought forward in that, in that event. Uh, you also may recall back in April we had a shooting or a shots fired event at Southdale Center and those suspects were identified with the good work of leveraging our community and asking through social media for people to help us in identifying suspects and that was helpful and that aided in a very successful investigation and later led to some arrest and charging in that case as well. We recently had a bank robbery at the Royal Credit Union. Uh, that work is still underway. That case is still open and active. I'm limited in what I can talk about but we are actively following up on leads in that case. And then lastly, uh, we had a robbery attempted carjacking at 70th uh, Street West and Antrim Road. And in that case, our response was very quick and we were able to locate and identify and arrest the suspects involved in that case. And those, those suspects were also uh, charged with that crime uh, days after the fact. Uh, a couple of points to, to kind of focus on here in terms of our continuous area of focus. Um, like I said before, we're seeing a lot of suspects come into the community in stolen vehicles, looking to commit other crimes and find new cars to steal. And that very much has been consistent for the last couple of years here and also across the metro area. So it's a big focus for us on the crime prevention side. We'll talk more about that here in a second. In speed enforcement, we dropped uh, many city street speeds uh, limits down to 25, and so we get a lot of complaints. We still have people that are kind of trying to figure out how to comply with that and reduce their speeds in the residential areas, and so that's still a major focus for us is to continue that speed enforcement so that we make sure everybody is safe here in this community. About a year and a half ago, in response to a number of thefts and uh, higher profile events, we launched something called Safe Cam Program update or Safe Cam Program, and that was uh, intended to really reach out to neighborhoods, uh, private homes, businesses, and ask that people provide the information about their home if they have a camera, if they have any opportunity to record something that may have occurred in their neighborhood, and to submit that to us so that we can maintain a list of who actually might have a camera in our community should something happen in a particular neighborhood. We launched that campaign, we talked about it, we marketed it, and we had a really good turnout early on. And this is just an update for everyone, um, just to share out that we have 225 cameras that have so far been registered either through private residential properties or businesses, which is outstanding for us. And Again, we're just trying to build out our capacity to make sure that we have a nice network of cameras uh, and evidence collection opportunities that may exist should something happen in your neighborhood. So if you're interested in that, on the slide or on the screen, you can go to that website and just simply put your name in and your address and then we will maintain that list. We do not have access to your camera system. Uh, we provide or we ask for permission for you to share the data with us. So we just want to make sure we make that distinction very clear. In response to some of that, uh, the crime patterns we just talked about, um, one thing we did a year and a half ago as part of a larger marketing campaign of crime prevention was uh, to do something called Lock Around the Clock. And our communications department was very instrumental in developing this out and it was a way to get the word out to, to residents and visitors of Edina to make sure that they're locking up their vehicles, their homes, uh, the personal effects. And we did a number of different things from videos to our, our mayor. Uh, writing a letter to our residents and a, a lot of social media posting to explain what that was and just to get the reminder out to people. And we also um, used newsletters to get the word out as well. Our officers also are equipped with cards um, so that if they're out and about in the community and they see somebody that may need a reminder, you might get that reminder from our officers, which is just really intended to get that crime prevention piece out there to make sure people lock up their homes and their properties. Another acronym that we came up as a result or as part of that marketing campaign was something called TIME and it's an acronym for T, take your keys with you, I, in your car, don't leave valuables visible, M, make sure you lock all windows and doors, E, even when you're home, close garage doors. Again, it goes back to just very simple crime prevention tips to avoid auto thefts, which is just 
close your doors uh, if you're not nearby it and lock your doors. And oftentimes what we're seeing with people that are looking to, again, steal cars, they're just looking for those easy opportunities. So the more you can do to close your garage door, it's more likely that a person is just going to travel on past and look for the next opportunity. So there's a lot that you can do to empower yourself to help all of us out with crime prevention and take those necessary steps to protect your home to avoid being a victim of a similar crime. Just some additional crime prevention tips as a reminder. Uh, take your vehicle keys. Do not, please do not leave them in your vehicle or in a spare key holder. Do not leave your car running while unattended. Close and lock all windows and doors when you park. Park in well-lit areas when possible. Never leave your valid bills in your car, especially if they can be seen from outside the vehicle. That's very key because it only takes seconds for somebody to come along and break a window and take whatever is inside. So purses, um, valuables, things like that, you wanna make sure you take with you. And please, again, close your garage doors. Even if you're home, even if you're in the backyard, you're not gonna be in your garage, please close that garage door. Switching gears here a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about our community engagement uh, events. When I started, we've been really good about our community, community engagement events and planning, interaction with our community, but we also want to enhance that coming out of uh, COVID. We wanna make sure that we get all of our staff engaged in this type of work moving forward. So we're just here to, I just wanna highlight a couple of recent examples. Um, one of the things that we started up new this year was to do more of a micro level uh, neighborhood meeting in the areas that we're seeing some of these upticks in crime, particularly with auto theft. And so we recently sponsored a community meeting with this focus on auto theft prevention um, over at Morningside. And we have this, another one scheduled for Straw, uh, Straw Coward Park. And then we're also looking at Creek Knoll neighborhoods as well for future meeting planning. So we're gonna continue that work throughout the summer to try and get the word out to our residents uh, that are might be impacted by some of these recent trends. And that's just an opportunity to again, reaffirm these crime prevention tips and also provide opportunities for people to ask our staff a little bit more about what they're seeing and what they can do to help out. Art Together was something that started up last year. One of our officers came up with this great idea to do an art project uh, with kids in a neighborhood uh, with a lot of our staff and a lot of our officers and a lot of our police staff to go out and interact with kids in a, just a different way. We had one on June 21st. We have another one on June, July 19th and we have a third one on August 16th. If you're interested to learn more about that, you can just go to our website and, we'll, and, there, and that's where you can find that information. Family Fun Night was July 12th and 13th. That's another example. And of course, we have Night to Unite August 1st. That's our next big event where we will be out in mass to all the different block parties to interact with our community. And then lastly, we have our open house. This is new for us. We're going to have this on September 20th. Uh, we're going to open up our doors. We're going to host uh, guided tours of our police department. We're going to bring in a number of different kind of cool trucks and equipment, police equipment, fire equipment. We've got our relationships with some of our nearby law enforcement partners that are also going to bring in some cool things here for kids to check out and see. So we're going to set that up in our parking lot. And again, allow for people to come inside and just kind of get a snapshot of what it's like, what the Identity Police Department's all about, and explain to people uh, the great services that we provide here back to this community. More information on that will come out here relatively soon if you just want to stay tuned to our social media pages and, and you can find information there. Some new initiatives here, some things to highlight, JCPP. I won't read through the entire slide here, but this is called the Joint Community Police Partnership. And to sum it up briefly, it's a partnership with Hennepin County. This is a, this is a Hennepin County endeavor that's been going on for 20 plus years. They're the host. They work with a number of different police departments throughout Hennepin County to really work on building relationships between police departments and the communities they serve. It really worked towards building that trust and developing out those, those key points of contact throughout the communities. So we started that this year. As a result of that, we hired a cultural liaison who is embedded in our police department. Her name is Lulu. She's been outstanding for us. We just hired her on and she's been on with us now for about four to five months. And she's really focused on our Somali community that's growing and already forging some really good positive relationships with some key important people here in our community. So the work ahead will also involve just more interaction between our police officers and our members of the community. And it'll also get us into something called the MAC. And the MAC is the Multicultural Advisory Committee. That committee, those community members come together on a monthly basis and they meet with us, myself included, to sit down and just talk about things that are going on in the community. A good example of that might be a national event that could have occurred and question marks that come up about maybe how law enforcement might have handled that situation. And community members might want to know more about that. So that creates an opportunity for us to sit down and build those trusting relationships, have some of those difficult conversations, and maybe get some guidance about how we should better police our community and build that trust. Building that trust is an important lift for us for the next five years. We're gonna be razor focused on that, and this is one way to do that. So we're excited about this. 
I also want to point out that we've been working very closely with the Edina Public Schools. Um, our, our work with the school is important because we've had a number of things going on across the nation when we think about the unfortunate events of active shooters. It's very important that we have a really robust response to some, some, an event like that. We reached out to the Edina Public Schools uh, recently, about a year and a half ago, and asked if we could do some more training with our, our fire and our police staff, and they were very responsive, and we've been doing that work inside the schools. We've also been working through some more community engagement opportunities. Edina Schools has a mission to get all the kids into some type of an internship opportunity with a variety of different organizations, uh, whatever the, the, the youth might be interested in. And we're focused on this because law enforcement, we think, could be an important role to play or an important opportunity for a youth to check out. So we've been really working closely with the Edina Schools um, to really embed that and to get our officers involved and to think about how we can play that out moving forward over the next couple of years. And that's been a really good positive relationship for us uh, to move forward. So it's been a fantastic experience for us to work with our school district here. Southdale Center, uh, we've had, as I pointed out earlier, uh, a shots fired event there, so we've had a little bit of an uptick on some of those types of crimes. But we've recently talked to Southdale reps to think about some new technology. License plate reader technology is one of those things. And so we're happy and excited to report out that Southdale, uh, owned by AM Properties, has invested in some new, this newer technology. A license plate reader camera system, if you're not familiar with it, will automatically read stolen vehicles that may travel past. Um, and so when that happens, that will alert out to our dispatch and we can uh, allocate our officers and have them respond to the area to deal with the stolen car that may have passed by. We're also in negotiations with Saltdale Center and it's very exciting to get an officer or two back into the mall. Uh, this was a model that was in place many years ago and for a variety of reasons has kind of dissipated but because of the kind of the the volume of customers and things that are changing. We felt it was important to get officers back in there to help us out on the public safety side of things. And so South Hill has been very responsive to that and we're happy to report out that by next year we'll have at least one officer inside back inside that mall. Switching gears just a little bit for technology enhancements, we just want to point out that we're really focused on uh, electric vehicles and the change of technology and getting different types of vehicles out into the community. We have currently a Mach-E on our uh, in our fleet. We have one Ford Lightning truck that's currently out in our fleet right now. I believe it to be the first Minnesota Police Department with an electric vehicle pickup truck um, produced by Ford. And that's been a really successful hit for our officers. Um, they've enjoyed the space accommodations uh, being lifted off the ground a little bit better. And of course, it's uh, very quick uh, when driving. So, so far, our officers have given us really good feedback on that. We put an order in for two more, and we expect to take delivery and outfit those two uh, later on this summer. So you'll likely see three different pickup trucks that are uh, EV uh, moving forward. They also perform pretty well. Uh, they've been, the charge has been holding up for a full 12 hour shift and that was key for us to check that out as part of the pilot project. And so far that's coming back in a positive way. So again, we're gonna continue to build our enhancements, our technology enhancements out on the electric vehicle side of things. The state offers grant opportunities and we're happy to report out that we've received uh, a couple different grants over the next couple of years to pay for more of these license plate reader technology cameras but these are for the community at large. And so uh, we're gonna look to buy or purchase or at least 10 Flock, and Flock is the company that we're going to look to contract with and then distribute those around the different community or areas of the community that we're seeing upticks in crime and stolen cars in particular. Uh, another camera that we're going to look to uh, purchase uh, and or lease is a PTZ camera, which we will likely uh, mount on the water tower near Southdale, and that'll give us just another opportunity to just to check out and see what might be going on on crime front status. Also, the Crime Fund, which is a nonprofit organization, has also uh, come forward with some funds to help us lease some additional cameras. And so those are also in the queue and ready to go. But we're really close to getting these live. And so my, my hope here is by late summer that we will be live with this technology in the field here and utilizing that, which we think will be very valuable for us to help reduce auto thefts. And I got a little bit ahead of myself here, but this is just kind of a rundown of the different um, LPR tech cameras and the different types that we're looking at, stationary versus mobile. And a stationary camera is basically affixed to a pole and stays put, whereas a mobile camera allows us some flexibility to deploy a camera into a neighborhood or wherever a hotspot might uh, evolve. We also use it not only for stolen vehicles, but we also look, you know, if a plate is tied to somebody that might be missing, it will flag an alert out on that. And anybody that might have some really significant wants or warrants tied to a vehicle, that can go into the database and alert out to officers that that vehicle may have passed by any given particular camera in the city. 
It also is a great and valuable tool for evidence collection, but to help us out in major cases and our investigators will um, have access to that database to allow for really good follow-up cases on those higher level uh, major crimes. Officer wellness is a very important topic for us. I just want to point out a couple updates on that. We've, in the last couple of years, uh, allowed for and also promoted workout on duty. We feel it's very important for officers to come off the shift whenever they can to come into the gym and do a little bit of exercising. We have now for a couple of years provided mental health check-ins. It's an annual check-in, so our officers, myself included, are required or mandated to go in for a sit-down. More therapy if you need it, but more uh, instructional in nature and just to give services and tips and pointers on how to kind of cope with, but also most importantly, how to have a long, successful career and understand the mental health side, the challenges of the job uh, before us. Sigma Tactical is another company that we're bringing in to do what we call blood draws for cardiac uh, diagnosis. And so all, most of our officers are gonna go through this later on this year to understand what kind of um, issues potentially could be brewing um, based on the blood draw to understand on the cardiac side of things if there's some improvements that need to be made. And again, give our officers awareness about some different dietary, physical fitness things that they could be focused on to make sure that they're healthy. And then lastly, we're uh, very close to launching, uh, we're excited about as a therapy dog or a wellness dog, you might have heard it that way. And that is a soon to be a puppy or a dog that will be inside of our, embedded in our police department just to kind of be a comforting dog and to navigate the hallways and interact with our staff in a different way. And we're seeing this start to take off now across the metro area. And I'm pleased to report out that Edina Police is also gonna take part in that. So we're excited about that later this year. Hiring and staffing update, just a quick update. Uh, we continue to recruit officers like most other agencies in the metro area. We're, we're down just a little bit, and that varies from department to department. It's very challenging to hire and find recruits uh, and bring them in in this current market. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've never seen it the way it has been in the last couple of years. We currently have four openings, but we do have cadets and CSOs that are backfilling, and we're currently in a process. So I'm very optimistic by later on in the summer that we'll have our current vacancies backfilled. We have have launched something called a cadet officer program about a year ago and that's been a very big success for us we have one cadet recently promoted to officer and we have a couple more cadets that are going to be promoted later on this summer and that is intended to really mentor our future officers um, these are typically candidates that come from college or just out of high school uh, we will pay for their tuition and we will mentor them and develop them out with essentially a guaranteed pathway to becoming a police officer here. And so it's already paying off. The return on that investment's been huge for us. And we're just gonna continue to leverage that and maximize that to our benefit and also to our future candidates benefit as well. So that work will continue. I see we're getting close to 7.30 here. And so just to wrap up on my final thoughts, just as you think about the things that we do and what we're focused on, for our staff, I really just boil it down to three different areas. Crime prevention and reduction strategies, so that encompasses a lot of things that we talked about tonight. Our community engagement, where we're not responding to 911 calls, what are we doing? We're spending most of our time engaging that community. And then of course our staff, we're really focused on our staff and making sure that they're, they're fit, they feel good about what they're doing. And excuse me, Siri, I didn't mean to activate Siri. And making sure that our staff uh, are feeling good about the job that they're doing. This is an outstanding community and so our officers are really dedicated, super talented, and they're ready to serve this community in ways that um, will continue to showcase their talents. And I just wanna end by saying that we have an outstanding department here, fantastic staff, and I'm super proud to be here to uh, represent this, this police department and this city uh, as the Chief of Police for Edina. So with that, I'll stop there and turn it over to questions. If you look on the screen, there's a number to call, and that number is 786-496-5601. And then you enter in the PIN, which is 179-807-4-POUND. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Milburn will now stand for questions. So if you have a question, please uh, call the number, use the conference pin. Uh, it, press uh, star one on your telephone keypad when you're ready to ask your question. An operator will mute your line and place you into the queue until it is your time to speak. And do we have any questions? We do. Operator, will you please unmute the line of our first caller? And caller, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Lori Gross, and I have a question for the chief, please. Um, how much did these lightning pickup trucks cost? It seems to me that I saw on the consent agenda that they were approximately $90,000 a piece. 
and what considerations did you take under advisement in making the decision to purchase these expensive vehicles other than they are electric vehicles which will have lower greenhouse gases? And did you also take into consideration that the battery banks in these trucks weigh a minimum of 1,800 pounds? And these trucks have very fast acceleration. If they happen to hit another vehicle, due to the physics, they become or can become a lethal weapon. Uh, a vehicle that weighs about 7,700 pounds hitting an average car, let's say my car, which is a Corolla, which is about 2,800 pounds, I'm dead meat. Um, when you put that much weight on a vehicle with those electric, with the batteries on that, uh, it becomes a dangerous vehicle. Did you consider that at all? And what were the other considerations that were taken into account other than it being um, an electric vehicle for the greenhouse gases? Also, the second question is uh, for the station that you're going to be setting up again at Southdale Mall at Simon Properties. Is Simon allowing to you to use some type of uh, space for no charge within Southdale for your uh, police substation in there? Thank you. Thank you, great questions. Uh, let's first talk about the fleets and the vehicles. I don't have the exact price point on those vehicles coming in, but factors that we consider, one thing I wanna point out is it is a pilot. And so the very questions you're asking where it's gonna take us a couple of years to kind of vet that out and understand really what the long-term implications of that are going to be. Um, I also would like to point out that our officers go through extensive dri dri driving training. They have to go get certified, they go to a school, they go to pursuit training, and they, it's, it's pretty extensive, right? And so as you go through that, uh, you understand how to drive uh, a hybrid vehicle, a gasoline engine, or electric vehicle in a very safe and efficient manner. So whether it's electric or gas, we take that very seriously, so we want to avoid impact collisions. Um, your points are valid. I mean, it's heavier duty, so we also want to be even more cautious as we navigate our way around the difficulties and challenges of driving. But I'd say that also holds true with any other vehicle that we have in our fleet, because all those vehicles, I think, could be subject to the things that you're talking about as well. Other things to consider when we think about fleet is the longevity of a vehicle. So what we're going to study is how long does it take? Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, you're not doing oil changes, so we anticipate some savings on the mechanical side of things. On the maintenance side of things that we would have to do quite often um, that we don't, right? So we're going to study the financial cost associated with that over the course of time. And in these vehicles, these trucks are multifunctional, multi-purpose for us. So when they're done and they conclude what we call their life service or useful life, usually adds, it ends up being about three to four years when you start to get into mileage up. Uh, it doesn't go away at that point. We transfer or we call it roll it down to a different division. So oftentimes it could go over to Parks and Rec, for example, uh, liquor store operations. Also our CSOs are good candidates for that because they don't have to do that emergency driving. And so then we'll get more maximized, maximized potential out of the vehicle and continue to study that. And we're going to learn about the battery over time too. And we're going to learn what it's going to take to replace that. And so there's going to be a lot of learned lessons as we go through it, I think, over the next year or two. Based on initial feedback that we've gotten, we're confident to say, let's get a couple more, uh, because even if it doesn't fit for police use, it will fit somewhere else within the city structure and the city fleet operation. So we're very confident we're gonna get full use out of it and start to realize those savings and those costs long-term over the course of time. The second question, Scott, maybe you can help yeah. me with The <clears throat> second question was regarding uh, our interactions with uh, Simon Properties and whether or not uh, we were discussing with them a presence in, in the mall of yeah. some sort, and are we paying for that? Uh, how is that going right now? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, our focus, our mission with that is to be more present. So the old model was more, I would say, undercover, kind of shoplifting focused to help out with that undercover role, that capacity. Whereas now that we know that some things from a crime standpoint have changed across the metro area, unfortunately, violent crime has gone up. Uh, we want to make sure that we're more of a presence uh, inside that mall. So it's clear to 
to people that the police department is in collaboration with security and providing safety and structure within the, in the mall settings there as well. Uh, we're currently negotiating uh, with Simon Properties some space within the mall that we can put our logo on and make that clear. Kind of think of about maybe a Mall of America if you've ever been by there and see how their office is set up. It would be kind of similar to that. And it definitely would be in collaboration again, just having that very visible presence. Uh, I can't get too far into the details about costs. I can share with you though that uh, Simon Properties and Pro uh, sorry Simon Properties and Southdale uh, are looking to help fund or pay for uh, that FTE and or that second FTE as part of that negotiations that we're under right now. Great. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Operator, will you please unmute the line of our next caller? And caller, please begin again by stating your full name and address for the record. My name is Jim Reisterer, and I live at 6900 Mark Terrace Drive. But this is about Valley View Road. My house is on the corner. Um, my question is, well, first of all, I was glad to hear that there's some attention given to speeding because it's just out of control on any major through street in Valley View Road, which is happily at 25 miles per hour, is no one drives that. Even city vehicles do not drive 25 miles an hour. Even the police vehicles that go up and down the street do not drive 25 miles an hour. Um, I've lived in Edina for 30 years. Um, other than a few stops near 50s in France, I've never once seen uh, anyone pulled over for a speeding violation except on Highway 100. Can you talk more about what the plans are to um, get people's attention about driving the speed limit? Thank you. So Chief, that's a, a question we hear um, a lot actually is why do we do so much uh, speed enforcement on the state highways that, that uh, divide up our city? Can you talk a little bit about that and also then uh, a little bit more detail about the speed enforcement we do on city streets? Yeah, absolutely. So the complaints come in from a variety of different ways, right? And in this community, we're uniquely positioned. We're kind of right over Highway 100 and 494. And so it does draw us into helping State Patrol with some of that speed enforcement. We're also out there looking for DWI offenders as well as part of that work, right? Uh, we've been blessed with not having a lot of high call volume for violent crime. And so it affords a little bit more opportunity to get out on those highways. But I can share with you in the last couple of years, coming out of COVID, prioritizing some more significant issues, so I'll think auto theft, uh, the impact of residential neighborhoods, we have pulled our officers off the freeway system to focus more on our residential properties. That should also, and also does go along with the change in the speed limit. Uh, we care and focus more about the residential at this point in time and the evolving auto theft problems that we've talked about and getting our resources where they need to be in these residential areas. And so if you've noticed not as much police presence on Highway 100 or on the freeway system, that's by design. State Patrol is a phenomenal organization. We will help when we can, but that's their primary focus, right? And so we wanna make sure that we're uh, adapting and, and doing the things that that, um, are important for Edina residents as well. Also, it's a good opportunity to point out what's to come. So when we think about uh, marijuana and the new law changed August 1st, uh, we're gonna be focused on what that impact might be for impaired driving. And we don't know what that's gonna look like yet, but we're uh, well equipped and trained and we have officers that are, under, are trained to deal with the effects of that or anybody that might violate that law. And so that, that's just another focus for us from a traffic safety standpoint to make sure people are compliant with the law and not, um, not under the influence of THC products. Um, so you could see us on the highway and doing that enforcement. And then lastly, there are grants that we sometimes will work into, which are called TZD, they're state funded grants. And those are hotspot traffic enforcement details across the metro area. So there's times where you could see a St. Louis Park, uh, Eden Prairie, a Minnetonka, and a Bloomington and an Eden Prairie officer combined with state patrol in a certain zone or a certain area on Highway 100, for example. And they might be doing that kind of work as part of that state granted opportunity. It's an overtime uh, detail we call for officers to partake in that. And so we're looking for DWI offenses, uh, seatbelt violators, and certainly speed as part of that. But that happens throughout the year. So it just changes quite a bit. We're very responsive to the complaints that come in. If you ever have complaints about speed issues, call our police department. We'll get you lined up with the supervisor or a lieutenant, and then they will then assign our officers to go and enforce those speed issues and it, it's pretty much every day that we get complaints that come in. The last thing I'll say about that is that as we get our staffing numbers back to where they um, need 
to be that we're going to go back to having an officer dedicated exclusively to traffic. We had that years ago. And we had to pull that back due to staffing issues and COVID and things like that. But we're going to bring that back and that will get an officer out to be very focused on the speed issues that we're seeing in the community. And we also have motorcycles here. We had two motorcycle patrol uh, units that we utilize for this work and we restructured that in the last year. So you might see a motorcycle patrol officer out there and they're very intentional about looking for speed violations. They can navigate into certain areas and kind of keep an eye on that and kind of strategize and get in a good spot. So if you do see a motorcycle out there, that's very much by design to help out with the speed enforcement as well. We do have one more caller on the line, but I would like to remind anyone else who's listening that now would be a good time to call in. That phone number again is 786-496-5601. Once you're connected, enter our conference PIN, which is 179 pound Then press star one on your telephone keypad when you're ready to ask your question. With that, operator, please unmute the line of our next caller, and caller, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Go ahead, caller. Our caller has dropped. I must have, I must have scared him off. <laughs> um, I don't have any other callers in the queue at this time. As a reminder, if you would like to um, ask a question once you're in, please press star one on your telephone keypad. I would like to wait just a minute or so before we move on, giving people um, a chance to, to call in yet. Um, my clock shows that it's 741. I'll come back to you at 742 or when I have a caller, whichever's first. So is this a good time for witty banter between, yes, it is. Uh, one of the tech, um, tech resources that we didn't talk about in your presentation were drones. Yeah. What, what do we have? What's, what's our drone fleet like yeah. and, and what do we use them for? Yeah, great question. So we have a drone team. We have four different units, different size makes and models. And when the drone team is activated, it's typically to search for missing persons, missing children. If we have a SWAT call out and we need some overhead help here to get eyes on whatever the structure might be, we'll utilize that camera system for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very extensive training for officers and a few non-sworn to go through that to get certification. And so once they have that certification, they're on their team and they're just a complement as a resource to whatever might be happening out there. We've had some really good successes in the last, I'd say, two years. Um, so they've, they've, they've really proven to be a good resource tool for us. So they're not used for community surveillance. They're not up all the time. Not they're at all. there for very specific situations. That's right. The FAA has some very strict guidelines, uh, protocols in place, and we cannot just arbitrarily put them out there. There has to be a very specific mission behind that, which gets into the things that I described. Got it. Yeah, great question. Jennifer? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, that's all we have for tonight. As a reminder, you can continue to ask questions about the operations of the Edina Peace Police Department online at our bettertogetheredina.org uh, website for the next week. The online conversation closes Tuesday, July 25th. Our next town talk will be held at 7 p.m. on Thursday, October 5th. The star of that town talk will be Fire Chief Andrew Slama, and he'll join us to talk about the operations of the fire department. Please join us then. Thank you, and have a great night.